You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Mention Ross, Ohio to anyone familiar with the southwest corner of the state, and it will conjure up images of a typical small Midwestern town. And it is. It's home to farms, churches, schools, a bakery, antique shops, and the first link in a chain of government facilities that manufactured the atomic bomb. Fifty years ago this week, at the dawn of the Cold War, the federal government announced its intention to build a $30 million atomic plant in rural Hamilton and Butler counties. The implications of that decision have reverberated through the community for a half a century. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Military strategy in the last half of the 20th century, the era of the atomic bomb, was dominated by the theory of mutually assured destruction. MAD only worked as a deterrent to war if both the United States and the Soviet Union were equally capable and willing to destroy each other. That meant a massive buildup of atomic weapons. And the first link in that process was based right here in Greater Cincinnati at the Fernald plant, located in northwestern corner of Hamilton County and spreading into Butler County. As part of the 50th anniversary of Fernald, the Department of Energy commissioned a documentary featuring the voices of former Fernald workers and community residents. We will use elements from the documentary throughout the program. Let's begin with a clip on the production process from the workers' perspective. I knew absolutely nothing about the process. Production? Absolutely nothing. That may seem really hard to believe, but I knew nothing. Well, I guess it was down there 10 years before I found out what they're all doing. I don't think we really knew what we were doing, to tell you the truth. I, we were there, we know we were machining slugs, we didn't know exactly how these slugs were used. The total process, as far as I was concerned, was four steps ahead of me. I don't think we were really aware of the uh, weaponry. I didn't know right away our end product was being used for weapons. Your information was restricted to what you needed to know to do your job. Everything was classified secret, or in some cases even top secret. So everything had a code name or a code word. Product information, product delivery schedules, product configuration, uh, whereas the process itself of producing uranium was pretty well known, established in textbooks. And the only secret was how much we made. The transition from ore to found uranium product was something to behold. It uh, was true technology. The actual process was more black art and witchcraft. Fernald was the one and only source. And primarily, we served the reactor sites, which then obviously made the plutonium and started this whole process on the chain. We produced the highest quality, the finest uranium metal in the world. The entire program this morning will be devoted to the past, present, and future of Fernald. I am joined by Dennis Carr, the Executive Project Director of Floor Fernald, the contractor responsible for cleaning up the site. Mr. Carr has worked at Fernald since 1981. Glenn Griffiths is the Deputy Director of the Department of Energy at the Fernald site. He has worked at the site since 1993. Kurt Paddock, is an economic consultant to the Fernald Community Reuse Organization, popularly known as The Crow, an effort to help the transition from the cleanup stage to the future. Everybody, welcome to Newsmakers. Kurt, welcome back to Newsmakers. You were here several years ago to talk about the, the future of Fernald. Um, Dennis, let's begin with the past. What was it, you know, we're talking about, we saw in that video, that little clip, these slugs that were being produced. What was it that Fernald actually produced and how were they used? Fernald over the 37-year uh, production history actually began in 1951, its production and ended in 1989. Really had one single mission was high purity uranium product. The primary, pr primary product was fabricated uranium fuel elements for plutonium production reactors that were located at the Savannah River South Carolina site for the Department of Energy and the Hanford, Washington site in Richland, Washington. Okay, so these, you say primarily, were there other things they were used for? Uh, those elements, there were, there were other products at this site, other high purity uranium products. Uh, 
in the later years of our operations, we produce a quite a bit of depleted uranium for armor for uh, tanks. So, but our primary product was fuel elements for uh, plutonium reactors. Now, these this uranium that was worked with to, in order to get these slugs, Glenn, where was this material coming from? Where was the where was the raw stuff that was worked with at Fernald coming from? Well, it came from a wide variety of sources. Some of it came from the uh, Belgian Congo. Uh, hmm. Some of it came from other parts of this country. Uh, at that time, uranium was a very uh, scarce and valuable resource. Uh, since that time, large deposits have been discovered elsewhere, particularly in Canada and places like that. But um, it was milled to a certain consistency and then came to Fernald. And it, if you think of uranium, if you think of uranium sort of like uh, crude oil from the standpoint that it starts out in a certain form and it goes through various stages and whether it's a solid or a liquid or a gas it can be in very very different forms so it's difficult to say exactly what form was at what particular step of the of the way and most people think of uranium as a as a rock as a as yeah. a metal product as a mineral uh, that that is true it starts that way but it, it, it can be in very very various forms Okay. Uh, I want to move on and uh, sort of move to another uh, perspective on this. And for the workers, production was one side of the equation. Safety was the other. There's some things there that scares me to remember. The drums would just combust just because it's hot. That HF, was, it'll burn you just like you'd stuck your arms in the fire. A blowout, they called it. It would blow a hole right through the crucible and the stuff would spew out all over the place. You would see a, a, a haze, like a fog, hanging from the ceiling lights, and you knew that that was the dust from the production. Concentrated ammonia is, uh, was the chemical that concerned me most in terms of safety and health throughout my career, really. Nitric acid fumes, oh, they, they'd choke you. Hydro Fluoric, I believe it was, acid, and hexa, hexa something, uh, gas, and uh, they were nasty. And you just wondered, well, is this going to be the killer in the air, isn't it? We never wore any protective gear. For the time, we had all of the available protection equipment that, you, that was needed. Overall, they had the equipment there, but they sure didn't stress you using it. That's another perspective and sort of the workers' voices. And by the way, I, I remind people that this is a documentary produced, uh, DOE, Florf, and Ald working together. Um, and a lot of different voices, a lot of different opinions. Looking back from the perspective of 2001, Glenn, how would you evaluate um, working conditions and standards in, at the peak in the, in the late 50s and the 60s at uh, Fernald? Well, certainly they were typical of the conditions that were there at the time throughout most uh, heavy manufacturing types of industries. Fernald was essentially a metal foundry. It just happened that the metal that was being used was uranium. Um, safety was always a very important aspect of work at that time. Um, here again, this is the 50s and the 60s. Things are very different then versus now. We know a lot more about various exposure levels to workers and things of that nature. Uh, but I don't want to imply that safety was never in a, a very important element of what was going on out there. But we have learned a lot o over the years, and our safety record right now is, is excellent. We've had over 7 million hours worked without a lost time accident. You mean in this, in this more recent period? Yes, sir. Right. Mm -hmm. How many people worked at Fernald over its production life, uh, 51 to 89? Well, the total number of people, I, I guess everyone knows the number, but uh, we varied from initial operations of about 1,600 in 1951. It peaked in the uh, 1960s at about 3,000 and then tailed down during, uh, during the 1970s to about 500. And uh, in the Reagan era, uh, we started a, a rebuild, came up to around 1,100 and up to actually around 2,000 peaked at. And now we've come back down. I think we're about 1,800 now. So over the span of years, uh, you know, literally thousands of of local tri-staters participated in the Fernald 
uh, history. Which is interesting because I think maybe because of where it was out in the, this sort of rural area of these two counties, a lot of us just didn't pay much that's attention that's to that's it. When we're talking about a plant that's operating with 3,000 employees, we're talking about a big industrial plant here. That is correct. I, uh, I grew up locally here, actually on the western side of town, and the first time I'd ever heard or seen of the Fernold plant was I went out there for an interview. And I was amazed at the scale of the facility to be sitting there. What did you think it was when you went there? To be truthful, I, I responded to an ad in the paper. It was fairly nondescript. I went out there and I pulled onto the access road and I thought it was a dog food plant. Uh, this gets repeated a lot in, the, in this uh, documentary right. that, because the <laughs> checkerboard on the uh, water tower, the red people, th and it said feed materials that's plant correct. out on the sign. So even driving out there. I did. I, that's when I pulled on an access road, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, what is the civil engineer coming out to this facility is producing dog food? <laughs> and uh, of course, I learned uh, better of that uh, during my interview. Glenn, uh, I know you grew up in Cincinnati as well. What did you know about Fernald and before you went to work there? Uh, I knew very little also. Um, I'm, a, I'm an east sider versus Dennis west side, but uh, I had recently gotten out of the Army during the Vietnam era and took a job in Oak Ridge, Tennessee for the Atomic Energy Commission at that time, which is now DOE. And uh, since I was from the Cincinnati area, they said, well, this will be great because you'll be able to help us with our plant at Fernald near Cincinnati. And I said, well, there is no place called Fernald near Cincinnati and there's no plant like that. And they said, yes, there is. <laughs> Uh, and I asked them where it was. They explained it to me. I called my father, who ran some bowling alleys uh, during that period of time, and asked him if he had ever heard of the place. And he said, sure, that they, they had some folks from the plant who bowled in some leagues at his uh, place of business. So uh, that's the first time I ever heard of it. And, and for the Atomic Energy Commission, secrecy was a priority. This was a plant where workers weren't supposed to talk about what they, what they were doing. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Uh, everyone had to have a security clearance there were different levels of that but everyone had to have one and uh, I still have one for for example and um, consequently it was just something that was not spoken about and it, the um, operative word was always need to know need to know well stay right there we're gonna take a break though okay. stay tuned after the break the turning point Seventh, which happened to be Pearl Harbor Day and uh, that turned out to be sort of the Pearl Harbor for Fernald, really. In 1984, a failure of the dust collector at Plant 9 at Fernald released almost 300 pounds of uranium oxide dust into the environment. That release became the turning point in the history of the plant. It changed uh, Fernald forever, and I think it changed DOE forever. It uh, took the lid of secrecy off of Fernald and what we did here, and uh, created enormous public awareness suddenly. Welcome back. We're talking about Fernald and that turning point uh, in 1984 when the dust was released, that really cha transforms Fernald from a production plant into the center of an environmental, uh, the environmental movement is really sort of getting on there. What was that like? You were there at that time. It was, it was definitely a uh, very sudden, instantaneous kind of uh, reaction to the plant. One day we were a fairly uh, sleepy little production facility. The next day we were on, a, on the front page of the Enquirer. It was, uh, it was a very enlightening experience, I have to say, to live through. From that day on, uh, we were in the attention of the national press and uh, I think brought forth some very significant changes in the Department of Energy, both at Fernald and nationwide. We became the lightning rod for the DOE complex for change. Glenn, given what we know now, how much environmental damage, how much was released out there? How much damage was there at the site? Was there beyond the site? What do we know about the environmental impact from now almost 20 years after when this all began to become public? Well, I think mostly we've learned that uh, a tremendous amount of soil was definitely contaminated. Uh, 
part of the aquifer also was. We have spent many years studying this, documenting it, uh, working with the Environmental Protection Agency and other regulatory bodies to document the current situation that we have. Um, that process took almost 10 years to get all the paperwork part of it taken care of. Uh, during that time, we were doing some cleanup activities also, but in, in earnest, our, our cleanup activities really started around the 1992-1993 time frame. And when you say soil was damaged, how far beyond the plant itself? Well, those studies were done sometime back, and I wasn't there at the time. Okay. However, uh, it's my understanding that off-site contamination was relatively small. Um, there's a couple mile radius beyond the plant boundaries where quite a bit of uh, sampling was done. And uh, most of the uh, contamination that we are dealing with right now is certainly on the, on the plant site. Kurt, uh, I want to get you involved in this. Um, you work with the people and the government agencies out in that area. What is the perspective in terms of the long-range environmental impact, not only at the site, but beyond the site out there? How, how do people see uh, the damage that was done and the response of DOE over the last 15, 20 years now almost? Well, I think it's been mentioned it's uh, evolved significantly. There was undoubtedly a time as facts began to emerge and that people began to understand what was occurring there, there was the predictable response which would be very negative and in some cases angry. But I think what's really been learned at Fernald is a way that governmental agency and citizen organizations and public officials can work together cooperatively to develop a process that will lead to trust and confidence that the right steps are being taken. And I think that really characterizes the current situation. What about in relationship, and, and Kurt or anybody can respond to this, with the aquifer? I mean, land is one thing, and, but then you get seepage and drainage through the land down into, that's a major aquifer that feeds uh, not just that small area out there, but this whole region. How important is the damage to the aquifer? How, and, and what kind of lasting danger do we face there? Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Fernal site resides over what's called the Great Miami Aquifer. And like you said, it's about 960,000 square mile uh, aquifer, of which we sit on about 1,000 acres of it. Fernal site is contaminated about 175 acres of that aquifer. It's a, it is a designated sole source aquifer under safe uh, drinking water. It is a valued protected resource. Our, our contamination, uh, it, uh, without any remedial action, any actions that we would take would essentially last for uh, thousands of years. And so we're uh, right now in the process of restoring it. We think we're on a path to restore that within 10 years back to a safe uh, health protected People level. don't understand what an aquifer is. It's like a very slow moving underground That's river right. and, and it has tremendous implications. So once something like this enters at one point, it's in there and it can flow and, and it can flow both ways, actually. That's correct. Um, what's actually happening at the site right now? Is that past? What about right now? What are you doing at the site? Uh, we're involved heavily in cleanup right now. In fact, in fact, all major projects are engaged in heavy cleanup right now. We're focused on soil cleanup at the site. Uh, as Glenn mentioned, there's extensive soil contamination. What does at the cleanup site? mean of soil? <coughs> cleanup of soil means that. Uh, you work together with the agencies, with the community, to establish health protective levels that are based on best available technical knowledge. You set those cleanup levels, and basically then you go out and uh, uh, look for the soil contamination that exceeds those levels, remove the soil down to those levels, and then demonstrate to everyone's, uh, to uh, statistically through processes so, to So show let's, it's let's clean. say I've now found a patch of soil that doesn't meet the standards that we've agreed to. It, it's worse than, it's w higher. What do we do with that soil? Do we haul it away? Do we treat it in some way? What, what do we do with that, Glenn? Well, we do several things. The, as Dennis mentioned, it depends on the level of contamination that is there. If, in fact, it meets what we call our waste acceptance criteria level for disposal on-site, we will dig it up and put it in our on-site disposal facility. And a disposal facility seals it? <coughs> it, is, it is essentially buried. Yes, it is. There are many, many layers to this structure. It's over, it's almost one mile long, and it's a couple of football fields wide, and it's about it will be about 65 feet tall, and so consequently, it's an above-ground storage area mm. 
that it has many protective layers and some engineered systems that are within that structure. And right now, about 80% roughly of all of the contamination on site will in fact be placed into that uh, structure. What about the other 20%? The, uh, the other 20 does not meet that level of, of the waste acceptance criteria. And so we, we then package that up and send it either to a DOE owned site in the state of Nevada or to a commercial facility which is located in U Utah right now. Okay, and does it get to those sites on railroad cars? Uh, yes, the contamination will get to the, uh, the site that Glenn mentioned in Utah is by train to the uh, Nevada test site is currently by truck. Right. Uh, Kurt, I know that people, uh, government organizations in that area are concerned about the cleanup at Fernald. They're also concerned about the transportation of uh, the material that has to be taken off the site through their communities. Are they satisfied right now, the governments that you work with, are they satisfied that uh, safety procedures are adequate? Well, in general, I believe they are. I think these gentlemen could comment on that more directly. What do you think? I think the answer is yes. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we own 170 rail cars. Uh, we have, at any given time, three trains. Uh, 60 cars each, one going out to Utah, one coming back, and one being loaded on the, on the site. We've made uh, 36 or 37, I believe. I think number 37 goes out uh, next week. Hmm. Uh, shipments, uh, there have been no incidents. It's, been, it's worked out great. And we are the largest shipper to the Nevada test site of any DOE site in the whole country. So, What will this site look like in 20 years? Well, it's probably best uh, addressed Well, by I, I'll, get, I'll get part of that okay, to him, okay. but I want to hear what you have to say about it first. Well, my vision uh, is an undeveloped park at the site. Uh, we're, we are uh, looking for uh, uh, you know, basically a natural uh, setting. It'll be uh, you know, perhaps wetlands. Uh, there'll be natural resource restoration at the site, and uh, we basically see an undeveloped park at the site, and that would remain under the ownership of the government forever. Safe enough for people to come on and maybe have trails and walk on? Definitely, or definitely. people would still have to be off of it? No, definitely would be available. It would be available if that's what the community would like for uh, people to come on site. Kurt, with the Crow, I know a couple years ago when you were on, you talked about maybe some of the site might be industrially redeveloped. Where does that stand, and if not, what's the, f what's the focus of the Crow at this point? Right. Well, due to uh, various uh, court decisions that uh, occurred several years ago, there's a requirement that the vast majority of the acreage be given over to natural resources restoration, and then there's the portion that will be given over to the on-site cell. So it really had been reduced to about 26 acres that might possibly be used for some type of economic development purpose. Since I was last talking with you, there's been a number of hearings with many different community groups, and the general consensus seems to be that the optimal use for that 26 acres would be some type of museum facility, some type of public records area, also some interpretive area talking about Native American remains that would be uh, left at the site. I'm very aware of time. If, that, if it's not going to be commercial use, what, what else is Crow doing real quick? Our focus is outside of the fence to help uh, create the kind of economic environment that will assure that there will be productive jobs for the workers when they leave the facility and for community residents that were dependent on their livelihood for the facility. Yeah, and that, that gets us back to the very beginning of this whole thing, that this has been a major employment site okay. for a long time, and that transition is very important. Yeah. Just about out of time, and we've just scratched the surface, but I want to remind people that on Tuesday, if you're really interested in Fernald, uh, on May the 8th, Floor Fernald will commemorate the 50th anniversary or 50th history year history of Fernald. And the public's invited. It's all day beginning at 10 o'clock, tours uh, beginning at 12.30 and in the afternoon. And if you're interested in more details, there's a website, www.fernald.gov. So everybody's invited and you can take a look at that. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men shaping our region for the future. Have a good week. It wasn't the money. It never was the money. It was the principle. It was the point. No matter how much money you get, you still, uh, it's not enough money for what they did to you. $10,000 is a good chunk of money, but it doesn't buy you a life. Fresh played a huge role 
in defining what public participation really meant. I think they put a lot of energy in it. There's a lot of credit ought to be given to them for any cleanup that they drove it. People think it just happened. You know, it's a miracle. You know, suddenly people saw the light and corrected their ways. Well, that's not ever how it happens. It happens because of people who say enough is enough.